Welcome to the Iron Self Podcast, where we jump into health, fitness, mindset, and becoming the best version of yourself. Today with your hosts, Mike and Kayla Minion. On today's podcast, we welcome Tiffany O'Hearn. Tiffany is a nutrition and fitness coach, as well as an advanced functional breathing coach with the Oxygen Advantage. She is a co-host on the amazing podcast, The Pursuit of Wealth. Today, she finds herself more drawn to helping people via the power of their breath. She looks at it as a whole body approach to wellness, given that the breath is so vital for our existence, such a unique area of work. When Tiffany is not helping people, she can be found with her daughter, Lucy, who is the light of her life, or lost in the woods with her partner, Kara, or making people laugh with her wit and humor. Please welcome Tiffany. Well, welcome to the podcast, Tiffany. We are super excited to have you. Thank you. I am super excited to be here. I am, wow, I'm just open and ready. Let's let's talk. I love you guys. Well, I know we are going to, we talked about kind of diving into understanding the breath and our awareness. Um, and so I think that this is going to be such a great topic to share with our audience. So let's talk a little bit about the breath. Well, something that we've always said is, you know, breath is the fundamental movement, right? Without, without being able to breathe properly, then you're going to be stacking unhealthy habits on top of a, an instability to begin with. So I, I think that's a good place to start is kind of the mechanics of breathing and why it's so important to have that base knowledge. Sure. And I think that that's such a great place to start, especially given the iron body and their coaches right here. So let's get into that because this is something that was so profound for me. You know, I've been, you know, pretty active my entire life and, you know, kind of fell into the fitness world probably around my 20s when I realized like I could get a gym membership, like, whoa, this was cool. So I'm going to do that. And, you know, really started focusing on movement. I think that the body is the most beautiful thing in the world, especially when it moves well. And I think you guys can understand that, right? Like we know when we see a body moving well or one that's taken care of, you, you're you looking with such like admiration, like, whoa, that person works hard, you know? And what I learned through the breath work that really changed how I sort of perceived this was if you were not functionally breathing, you are not functionally moving, period, end of statement, right? And so I've spent so many days in the gym and whatnot working on form. And, and of course, I'm sure you guys have too. But what we're missing is the breath. Because what mm -hmm. is our breath, aside from keeping us alive, right? It serves as our base of movement. And so what do I mean by that? Our diaphragm, which is the largest breathing muscle within our body, it sits right below our sort of breastbone there. And you probably don't even know it's there, but by the end of this conversation, you're gonna know a lot about that diaphragm. And <laughs> probably not how to spell it though, cause it's weird. But, <laughs> so this diaphragm <laughs> is like a balloon within your body. And so when we're breathing functionally, and I'll get into what functional breathing means in just a moment, then that's where our inter-abdominal abdominal? Abdominal pressure comes from, right? And I agree. <laughs> yeah. So if you're not if you're not using your diaphragm, you are not functionally stabilizing stabilizing yourself because what the diaphragm serves to do is stabilize our core. So we can talk about core this, core that, sit ups, you know, whatever you want to say is like core. Well, if you're not functionally breathing, throw it all away. Not really, but you yeah. get what I'm saying, right? It's so vitally important. And we're going to get into how to do that because it's not just like, a, you're doing it wrong. Goodbye. Like, no, cool. I'm here to support. And so are you guys, right? So, so this diaphragm is super important to help stabilize our spine, to help stabilize our lower back, to help stabilize our ribs, to help stabilize our abdominals. So it's vitally important in all forms of movement. So how do I do it? That's a great question. Thanks for asking. So... <laughs> What we're going to do real quick, all right? And so so for you guys to feel it too. So you guys are going to be, you're going to be the audience because I'm only seeing you right now. So <laughs> you guys are the guinea pigs, Mike and Kayla, little guinea pigs. You guys are so cute running around. So what I'm going to ask you to do is put two hands on the outsides of your ribs here, like sort of right up beneath your breastbone. Okay. And then what I'm going to ask you guys to do is shut your mouth. And then what I'm going to ask you okay. to do... <laughs> <laughs> then what I'm, this is going to be fun. See, cause I'm sarcastic too, Mike. We got it. So then what I'm going to ask you to do 
is to breathe in from your nose and only your nose, okay? So why don't you take three deep inhales from your nose. And as you're breathing in, you should feel your hands expanding outward. And as you're breathing out, you're going to feel your hands moving back inwards. And so what that is, is picture a balloon. And so the balloon is inflating every time we take a breath. And you feel that from the pressure on your hands. And as we breathe out, the diaphragm is sitting, moving right back up into its resting position as if it was a deflated balloon. And all of that is, that right there is how you should be breathing. But and I, I think I like your diaphragm like balloon analogy. My favorite analogy to use with that is like an accordion because you're breathing into the outsides mm -hmm. of those ribs mm -hmm. and the accordion doesn't raise obviously the top part of it. And I think that that's a piece that a lot of people mm -hmm. miss is that they, when they often breathe, and I'm sure you're the expert on this, but their shoulders rise Correct. versus their ribs coming right. out, right? And so I, I always, in my head, that's what I visualize when I'm doing it. I'm like, okay, accordion into the outsides of those. Yeah, ribs. that's great. Well, I'm, Go ahead, sorry. Like, like you said, with breathing being one of the main functional movements, this is one of the things that I work on first and foremost with all the athletes that I work with. Because if we are not building on a stable breathing mechanic, then then we're we're doing ourselves a disservice. They're going to be sore through the neck because they're breathing like this. And you, every time they breathe, like Kayla was saying, those shoulders are coming up. They're, they're using their traps. They're using their upper pectoral muscles to actually get those breaths in. And they're just shallow chest breathing, Yeah, which is terrible for recovery. It sure <laughs> is. And you know, the, the funny thing about that is too, is that, you know, you're setting yourself up for injury and in ways that you probably don't even perceive because you could have poor breath and injure your knee. And we know that because it all exists on the same plane. And so hardly wherever we have our injury is not really where the weakness is. It's just where the chain broke. Well, and that's for a lot of people, uh, especially, well, I guess you should say a lot of women, um, and it's, they tend to uh, have like pelvic floor dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, the very first thing that you need to look at with pelvic floor dysfunction is how are you breathing? Right. It's, you also, it's also intertwined, especially like through the hips, through the psoas, through all this, like everything is so interconnected within our body so yeah like the, the pelvic floor dysfunction is a huge one. First thing again that we start them with there is, is breathing exercises yeah yeah and it's you know it's such an interesting thing because we're talking about breath and anyone who's listening here is probably being like yeah okay i'm breathing sweet which is great because that means you're listening to this right yeah <laughs> and so that's step one you are breathing and it's an autonomic function which means it's going to happen no matter if we do anything or not but what i'm hoping is at the end of this in those moments that you can do something, that you will do something. And that's it. Because it's not an all or nothing approach here. This may be very new to some of you that are listening. And perhaps you spend some time in, you know, a yoga studio or, you know, various areas where they do talk about breath work. What I'm trying to bring to you is breath work for every day, right? Outside of that studio. It has its place. I, you know, it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. The pranayama breathing and, and all of that, of course, it's beautiful. But what I'm hoping to do is to have you walk away with this tool also. And so when we talk about functional breathing, what exactly does that mean? Because I'm functioning and I'm breathing. So doesn't that good? Well, great. Yes, you are. But let's, let's break it down. So functional breathing is simply breathing for your metabolic need. And so what do I mean by that? So right now, if your metabolic need is to chase a soccer ball down the field at full tilt, does your breath match that? If your functional need is to deadlift 400 pounds, can your breath match that? If your functional need is to eat your food and digest, does your breathing match that? If your functional need is to be calm, does your breathing match that? And we can go on and on through all the different facets of our lives. So where in there does your breath match that? So right now, we're in a pretty calm state, right? You and I, the three of us, we look calm. Most yeah, time. right. Whatever. Yeah, We're awesome. chill. Awesome. Yeah. So our breath is literally the remote control of our nervous system. And that can be a pretty cool thing once you understand it. And so I'll repeat it again. Our breath is the remote control of our nervous system. And what I mean by that is the better that you can be about your breath, the better that you can understand it in a functional way, the better you have control over yourself. See, because we don't have control... <laughs> We don't have control over anybody else, you know? If somebody says something to me that elicits an emotion, because oftentimes that happens, you're gonna have that emotion. But what you do after it is the most important thing. 
right? Because yeah. after that emotion, now where do you go with that? Where is your control? And we all seek to have control, right? No matter what, we all want control. But we can't have control over other people, try as we might. We mm -hmm. only have control over ourselves and how we react. And so our breathing serves to do that. And so just from learning a couple or, or just understanding the breath in a little bit more of a dynamic way, you understand if you try it. Because I can tell you all about it, but you don't actually try it on for yourself. Then it's just me talking into a microphone, staring at Mike and Kayla. <laughs> well, and, and this comes back to that the planning without action is a disservice to yourself, right? Every, everybody has these grand plans. We all make plans and plans and plans. But if you don't ever actually take action on it, if you don't use the actionable items from something that you've learned, then, then it's just really it's lip service. For sure. Well, part of that is why too? Why is it important to have control over yourself? I mean, we we often will, you know, react in a certain way sometimes. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this where I react and then I'm like, ooh, ooh, wish, wish I hadn't done right. that. And, you're, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. So coming, being able to use the breath in that situation to help control an emotion or a feeling can be so critical. I mean, I use breath um, usually when I feel like a panic attack's about to come on. Perfect. Right? I mean, the, the biggest one for me as a parent is being able to take our, our little people because they are emotion. They are raw emotion, these little, these little things, right? Um, and being able to take them out of these super heightened emotional states and being like, let's take some breaths here and start to regulate. And then they can actually think about what they're, what they're feeling. And then they don't become the emotion. They, they feel the emotion and then they can actually kind of start to think their way through it. I feel like you've used that on yourself though, too. A hundred percent. I was a firefighter for years. When I was in stressful situations, I would breathe so that I could actually concentrate, get the horse blinders off. Cause otherwise I'm looking at a giant fire and all I see is the fire. Once I start breathing, that perception opens right. up and then I can see the entire room before we do our Yeah, entry. for sure. And so that's so interesting that you say that because you know, what, what I, use this sort of this teaching for and i just ran a workshop i'm on my last one tomorrow and it's 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 titled pursuing the conscious mind and so what do i mean by that i simply mean becoming aware because again you cannot be aware of your breath 24 7. there's a reason why it's automatic it's auto right it just happens but when there's times that you can that's when you should. And just to your point, Kayla, right? How many times, and I'll, I'll illustrate this the best way that I know how. How many times have you sort of verbally diarrheaed everywhere and been like, oh, I didn't even know I had a stomach bug. Like, oops, <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Now I have to clean it up. Now I have to say sorry. And I really hate saying sorry, like my bad. So in those moments, the way that I try to understand it is you have your mind, you have your body and you have your spirit. And when I talk about spirit, I'm purely just talking about like a seat of your emotional character. Okay. So we have these three different pieces of ourselves. Can you guys identify with that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So you have your mind, your body, and your spirit. Well, oftentimes when we're feeling something dysregulated, and so what I deem to be dysregulated or dysregulation is really just an upheaval of a of this emotion, right? You're just feeling an emotion and it can become dysregulated. But the funny thing is, is that I illustrate it as being, I don't want to say positive negative, but if you have, you know, your line, right? And then this other corresponding line, we can put perhaps like anger and sadness and things like anxiety, fear, we can put those below the line, but we can also kind of put in happiness and we can put in like, you know, that romantic feeling when you first meet somebody and it's like, you know, you just want to be around that person all the time, right? So we might have all these other emotions and we'll put those up top. But to me, they all exist in that sort of dysregulation because if we look at the above the line feelings, right? You meet someone, you fall head over heels, you might choose to marry someone. Well, is that your mind, your body and your spirit talking? Or perhaps that's just your body and your mind right? Because you're feeling an emotion, but you are not connected. You're not aligned to yourself. And so you can use things like happiness, right? You might get a new Apple watch and you are so happy that you might, you know, I'm going to do all of these things. And then 10 minutes later, you've forgotten about all of these things. Do you know what I mean? So we can really think about these emotions as a spectrum because emotions are a spectrum, 
right? They're constantly oscillating between everything. But do we want them to control us? I don't, right? And so how do we connect our mind to our body, to our spirit? Through our breath. So that we are walking around representing ourselves as ourselves and not walking around disconnected from ourselves. And it's not a perfect, you know, you start this breath work and then you might react and you're like, well, Tiffany told me I would connect it all. And it's like, yes, do it just one time. Be consciously aware of it one time. And then you'll be consciously aware of it two times and three times, right? So it will just continue to build off of each other. Because as I say, it's only just 1% better. I'm asking you to think about your breath one more time today, not 755 times. It would be impossible. Just one more time. And so if that, if that seems like that could be you where you are walking around and you are not representing yourself, meaning you are not looking inward for yourself, then yeah, breathwork is for you. If you want to learn how to functionally move better, breathwork is for you. If you want to have control over your stress, this breathwork is for you. We can all talk about stress. You know, I heard, I listened to Dr. Rajan Chatterjee and uh, his podcast, and he quoted that 85% of all doctor visits, like general practitioner visits, 85% stem from stress. That means that there's so few people actually walking in. Well, actually, those people are probably like broken bones or something, right? But all these other are manifestations of our stress and they take control of our body. And then you might walk into your doctor's office and they'll say, well, you know, Mike, you're awfully stressed. And Mike goes, yeah, I know. I got this. I got that. I got this. I got that. And they say, all right, so you just work on that and we'll, uh, we'll just see you in a couple weeks. Or even worse, they just give you a pill and they're like, here, this, this will help you. Welcome and to the band-aid solution. It's like, well, this this actually isn't going to help me. Like, right. This this is the symptom, but it's not it's not it's, helping with the problem whatsoever. Exactly, and so and that's what they know to do. That's what most doctors do, through no fault of their own. That's just the world that we live in. But what's missing out of that is how do I temper my stress? Because mm-hmm. our stress is just the reaction to something, and we all know that we can feel stress. Right now, I'm pretty calm. You guys seem pretty calm. So perhaps something stressful that could ignite you yesterday or tomorrow could happen today. And it's like, no, we got this. We got this. We're going to handle this because you are already in a pretty calm state. But if we're in a little bit of a dysregulated state and something stressful or we perceive as stressful, now we're just building on top of it. And we don't know how to come back down. This, this is that resiliency that, that Kayla and I always preach about, right? Is building that resiliency. Like, not all stress is bad. This is why we work out. This is why we, you know, we, we do things that stress our bodies on purpose. But the whole reason behind that is to be able to come back out of that yes. stress and learning how to regulate those emotions. And again, like like you're preaching right now, is it, it's speaking to me because I'm a huge, huge believer in breath work. So being able to use your breath to come back out of that stress state. This is something that we preach to all of like the athletes that we work with, because when you, when you're working hard on the ice and like I work with hockey players, but when, when they're working hard on the ice and their heart rates at 180 beats a minute, they hit the bench. They have, you know, maybe 45 seconds, maybe a minute to recover right now. So all of my guys immediately go into deep nasal breathing with breath holds at the bottom so that they can just drop their heart rates. So they actually get that recovery by the time they're about to hit the ice again. Yeah. Well, and I think that a lot of people think that, that, you know, in order to cope with stress, I need to do this self-care practice and this practice and that practice. Which isn't wrong. Which, self-care is awesome. Self-care is really important and it's important to fill your own cup before filling other people's right. cups. But the other part of that too, and this is where you're coming with breath work, and I think that this is the big key here, is that grounding practice, that mindfulness, that awareness practice that comes with breath because breath links you to the present moment. You can't breathe in the past no. and you cannot breathe in the future. You are breathing right here, right now. And when you're saying, you know, focus on your breath for one more time today, it's like, come back to right now, one more time today. One more time today, just stop thinking about the future stop thinking about what was and start thinking about right here right Right. now yeah and on top of that it's like this breath is the one thing that you actually can tap into your ans with so now you can take from this 
super heightened sympathetic state and you can start some breathing regulation and all of a sudden you're you're dropping that level down into that parasympathetic state again so again it is that the ability control. to control mm -hmm. your own nervous system which is which is a superpower in itself. oh that was like that was when i gave you the mic yeah drop you, you saw that i saw <laughs> that too yeah, so you did mic drop to be super good. yeah Bam. my mic's not that expensive it might have shattered so i didn't want to take the risk <laughs> 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 but here's the thing and so you're talking about like mike what you were saying about resiliency and i can we'll highlight that just a little bit more so when we can control our stress what happens is our body will make adaptations and it will react accordingly. Our bodies are wonderful, beautiful. We can't even begin to understand how they regulate us the way that they do, but they do. And so when we can control our stress, perfect example is exercise. That is a controlled stress. Your body makes adaptations, and when you're done, it goes back to its homeostasis. Perfect. When we can control things like cold, cold exposure is a huge stressor, but it's a beautiful one. I'm sitting here without the heat on, because I want to become more resilient to the cold and to everything else. It is hard. It is not fun to sit here in the cold, but I've done it every day since it's turned cold because I want to become more resilient. It is how I'm going to build my resiliency. Cold exposure to stress, that doesn't make any sense, but it makes all the sense once you understand it. I'm building resiliency within myself. Another cool one is breath holding, which you know, if you follow some of the work, if you want it to work, like we can get into all of that. We won't be doing it today, but you get the point. Your body will make adaptations and then it's how do you come back down from that? So, you know, you're talking about the autonomic nervous system. And so we have two cool facets of the autonomic nervous system. One branch is the sympathetic nervous system. And so that is our fight or flight. That is the one that we want to kick in if like we're being chased by a grizzly bear. Like that's the one we want. That's cool. But not when you're in traffic. No, not when you're in traffic. And that's the funny thing because our fighter. Your body doesn't know the difference. But right, exactly. <laughs> and because we've continued to, to, to express it in certain ways that our body thinks being stuck in traffic is a grizzly bear yeah. because it can't discern look, the difference. Well, we were having this conversation the other day. It's like look, looking at your cell phone. If you are, let's say, a social media influencer and you look at your cell phone and you don't have as many likes right. today as you did yesterday, it's the same as getting chased by a damn grizzly that bear. That is so true. And so your body doesn't know how to respond other than what you tell it. So you're putting yourself into this heightened state. Now, we can talk about the other branch, which is the parasympathetic nervous system. And that is our rest and digest. That's the one we want when we are sleeping. We don't want to go to bed stressed. It does no good for us. So we have the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. Now, you want them to oscillate throughout the day. However, you don't want to be stuck in the sympathetic state. That is the stress state. And that is the state that's not good for us. And so now you're like, whoa, that's great, Tiff, but how? And so then I'm like, well, do it yourself. No, okay, so let's talk about that. <laughs> so the best way to illustrate this First and foremost, we're talking about breath work. When we're talking about functional breathing, and we talked about our diaphragm, but I think one of the pieces that we missed out is how to breathe. Let's talk about how mm -hmm. to breathe. <clears throat> now, we have two places that we can breathe from. Not like a turtle, I think they breathe from their butt. But anyways. Um, That's actually good to know. I like useless Yeah, thoughts. there is a one <laughs> animal, I think it's a turtle that like breathes from their butt. Now don't quote me on that, but you know, kids tell you the weirdest things. But so anyways, so we have two ways that we breathe. One is our mouth and the other is our nose. But our mouth serves no function of breath. Mm. Mouth is only ever made, as far as breathing goes, this, this is an emergency system right here. This is to off gas CO2 in a crazy amount right now. <laughs> right, in your sympathetic state. Chasing, yeah. being chased by a grizzly bear. Not that I got 72 likes instead of 74. So, <laughs> your mouth serves no function of breath, but your nose serves 32, which is pretty alarming when you think about it like that. Like, you would never eat out of your nose, right? You wouldn't do that? So we shouldn't be breathing out of our mouth. Now, if you are a performance athlete, that's a different story. If you are training for something, perhaps that's a different story, but you can out actually still take this into every other aspect of your life, except for when you're training like that, okay? So when we talk about our mouth to our nose, <clears throat> I can highlight a couple ways for you. 
our nose has all the functions of breath and our mouth does not. And so a couple of reasons that I, you know, again, until you experience it or understand it, it might become a little bit hard to understand. So first of all, you might, now that I say this, everyone listening might have shut their mouth because they probably had it open. <laughs> That's why I always say shut your mouth. It's not because I'm being rude sometimes, but not right now. So shut your mouth, right? And so the cool thing is, is that our nose has all the functions of breath. So let's say I'm super rude and I sneeze right next to you guys. Like I just walk up behind you and I'm like, Bleh! and you guys are both mouth breathing. You guys are literally inhaling all of my germs and they are hitting the back of your respiratory system. It's pretty gross, right? Drinking the boogers. Just straight up in there. We've all been there with our kids, right? They are just sneezing in our faces. Now, if I come up behind you and I'm sneezing in between you two, which I don't even know why I'd be doing that, but I did it, I'm sorry, and your mouth and your nose breathing, uh, your nose is already working to fight those germs. Filtering. You're totally filtering it, exactly. So that I feel like illustrates it pretty well for people because it's nobody wants to just eat germs. Like that's gross. The other thing is, is you are, when you're breathing from your nose, and, or excuse me, when you're breathing from your mouth, it also serves to dehydrate you or better yet, it's pretty cold where you guys are. It's pretty cold where I am now. You walk outside, it's like 32 degrees. You open your mouth and you start breathing and it literally slaps you in the back of the throat and actually causes pain. Well, mm -hmm. your mouth also doesn't moisten and humidif humidify the air like your nose does. So that's another key. Oops, mouth breathing because that hurt, right? It hurts when you do that. Now, we also have a really cool gas that pulls in our nose when we nose breathe that when we mouth yeah, breathe, we do yeah. not get. Mike's eager to tell us all about it. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just love where you're going. I, I He's love like it. a little Keep puppy. Going. Nitric oxide, nitric oxide. <laughs> <laughs> But funny enough, it's what they put in pre-workouts. Yeah, right. <laughs> Seriously. Nitric oxide is a powerful gas with so many different ways that it can help our body. For number one, when, we, the, when we're breathing in and out through our nose, it pools in our nose. And so when we're breathing in, we're bringing it down into our respiratory system. There, it becomes a bronchiodilator. So if you are experiencing any type of respiratory issue, well, get the gas. You got the gas, you know? And it might be hard to at first, you know, here I am talking about nose breathing and perhaps you shut your mouth and then you go like, hmm, this seems a little difficult. Like I was talking to a woman yesterday. She goes, well, every time I breathe out of my mouth, excuse me, my nose, it just feels hard. And I was like, yeah, that's going to happen. And here's a couple of reasons why. Number one, your nose is also has a lot of muscles in it. And so if you're not using it, they atrophy just like anything else. Mm -hmm. Same as your diaphragm. It can be very hard when you switch to nasal breathing to really fill that diaphragm. It's just because it's atrophied. And again, it's, it's no fault of anybody else's. Perhaps this is the first time you're hearing to breathe in and out of your nose. This might be the first time and it's okay. The other part of it is, is that your mouth is one big hole. Your nose is two smaller holes. So the amount of air that you're breathing in from your mouth can be a lot more voluminous but it doesn't make it better. You're actually getting less oxygen. Again, nitric oxide in our nose will help that. So there's two things that work against us. So we have our lungs, right? And so when we're mouth breathing, they're only filling up about halfway. And we'll get into kind of a way to feel that in just a second. So there's two ways we can help our lungs be oxygenated. One of them is nose breathing. And the other one, is well the way they excuse me that they're not being oxygenated and one is from mouth breathing and the other is gravity we'll stand you know we're, we're we're gravity people and the way to overcome these two sort of highlighted issues is one to nose breathe and two to nose breathe because when you nose breathe you're going to fill the deeper sp spots of your lungs and the second is is that when we get this nitric oxide that will overcome the gravity issue so that the blood and the oxygen is perfusing appropriately within our lungs. And so now we're actually getting the oxygen that we need. So if you guys can, for a minute, I want you to just put one hand on your upper chest and then put one hand again, like right underneath your breastbone there. And now let's take a couple, yeah, that's good. Take a couple breaths in and out of your mouth. See my shoulders going? Totally, 
Totally. And that's what's happening, right? Your shoulders are going out. Now switch to your nose. So. I don't feel it as much in my back. Yeah. So your experience is that when you're breathing from your mouth, that top hand is kind of flailing about, right? Your shoulders are kind of rising up. And also because I saw them, right? Your shoulders are rising up. Also, it almost, you feel like a dog, right? Almost, right? Like if you were to look at a dog breathing and then you just, you do it with your mouth, kind of intentional, it might elicit that feeling of like, well, I look like my dog. <laughs> People say you look like your dog, but that's fine. So when you're breathing from your diaphragm, right? That's the nose breath. And that's reaching your diaphragm. That's reaching the lobes in your lung appropriately. The other thing is, is when we talked about the nervous system and the two branches of it, when we're mouth breathing, we are activating the sympathetic nervous system. That is our fight or flight. When we're nose breathing, we're activating the parasympathetic nervous system. And so it's a great way to kind of feel it. Because again, if you don't feel it, you can't possibly understand it. You can't be motivated to try it because you haven't experienced it. So that's why I say mm -hmm. take a couple breaths with your hand on top of your chest. Feel what that feels like when you mouth breathe. And then with your hand on your lower, right beneath your breastbone, take some deep breaths in with your nose and feel what that feels like. Now, mm -hmm. if we are being cut off in traffic and we're breathing, we're, we're stressed about whatever happened today, someone cuts us off in traffic and we're mouth breathing, we are only serving to stress ourselves out more. We're only making it worse for ourselves. If you enter the day in a calm state, if you enter the day nasal breathing and something like that happens, I guarantee you'll have a much different reaction. If you do have that reaction, you will also have the tools to bring yourself back down. The parasympathetic nervous system is attached to this pretty cool nerve in our body called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, the root, yeah, the root is like wander. So it's the wandering nerve and it's the longest nerve within our body. So it runs from our brain to the bottom of our abdomen. But what makes this nerve so different is that it, it goes from our abdomen to our brain. Most nerves, all the other nerves go from our brain to our body. So that's kind of like that gut feeling that we feel like too. So the vagus nerve is in charge of pretty much every organ in our body. It could be very powerful nerve to work either for us or to work against us. So the other cool thing about this nerve is it does also run from our brain to our body. It runs from our brain to our heart. So now we have this top-down approach. We have this two-way flow of communication. And do we want it to work for us? Or against us. Now there's, if you, you know, or within the media circle, you might've heard about the vagus nerve. And now there's like machines and all these different, everyone says, you got to get your vagus nerve. You got to get your vagus nerve. Well, I'm teaching you right here how to activate your vagus nerve. It's just through your breath, but through nasal breathing. And so that also will help to bring you down. And Mike, you were saying about the kids on the ice, their metabolic need on the ice is to go hard and fast. Not a good time to be thinking about your breath. Cool. <clears throat> when you get back on the bench, what is your metabolic need? That's your, to that's your recovery. Get right back to your baseline and be ready to go. If no one's yeah. experienced that, if no one's actually ever told an athlete that, how do you know? You don't. So you're actually leaving performance on the table. You're leaving your performance out on the ice. You're leaving yeah. your uh, self disconnected from yourself. And again, we became mouth breathers, they suggest probably around the turn of the century where it kind of really started. So it's through no fault of your own. And here it is 2021 and all I do is scratch my head and think, this is about a hundred years too late. Not too late, but like a hundred years behind, I should say. Because why weren't we focusing on this, you know? And you know, a couple of reasons why we probably have switched to mouth breathing as a, you know, as our physiology kind of has changed. And it has to do with a couple of things. One, they think processed foods, you know, highly processed foods are really processed hard. Foods, yeah, yeah. And they're hard to digest and, and whatnot. And also you can look at, you know, when you were a baby and through no fault of anybody else's, this is not this kind of topic, but I'll just highlight it for a second. Being breastfed versus bottle fed. The reason why breastfed is 
better for a developing baby in their maxillofacial region. Again, I'm open to, you know, <laughs> this is not this kind of conversation. It's just the facts, right? It's very hard to drink milk from a breast. It's very easy to drink from a bottle. There's a reason why bottles are easy because if they were hard, nobody would buy them. <laughs> they would poke bigger holes in them. They want their babies to eat. Well, when the baby has a bottle versus a breast, it's that ma their maxillofacial, their tongue structure, their jaw structure, it's kind of being underdeveloped at that point. And again, through no fault of anybody else's. That's right. Yeah. And then, and then what do we do? We give our babies baby food, which baby food is awesome, but it's soft. And so again, they're not developing their tongue. They're not developing their jaw. So in all these places, we're almost becoming as a society in this transition, right? You know, it, it's, you, you're going to see more baby food. You're going to see maybe perhaps less baby, or maybe you perceive less babies to being breastfed or not. Well, it's just underdeveloping our, our faces purely, right? And so that can have a reason to switch to mouth breathing too. So you know, if we think about our tongue, like I'll ask you guys right now, it's a weird, super weird question, but where's your tongue right now? On top, the roof. top of my mouth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so open up your mouth and now where's your tongue? Yeah. <laughs> Mike's sticking his out at me. Um, so <laughs> it falls down. So if we are mouth breathing as children, in walks the dentist, in walks the orthodontics, because our tongue is the scaffolding of our mouth of our jaw. So if our tongue is not placed up on the roof, our teeth and our jaw are caving in yeah. through no fault of our own again. But then you sit here and go like, well, how come the dentist didn't tell me to shut my mouth? Like, I don't know, but we're here and now we're talking about it now, right? Like dental work, you know, orthodontics, most of it comes down from just not breathing well or breathing right for your body. So yeah. again, when you mouth breathe, you're exasperating yourself in every which way. You're making yourself far more stressed. You get that email, you're tucked over your computer, you're compressing your diaphragm, you can't even get a big breath. You're sending that email, your boss comes in. That sounds like a pretty stressful situation. Well, if you're mouth breathing, you're just making it worse for yourself. Again, it comes back to these tools in your control. When you're mouth breathing, yeah, you're just eating people's germs. Full on, getting them right in that mouth. I mean, we wear masks now most of the time, but still, right? These are all just some reasons why to switch to your nose. Now, it is going to feel hard. It's going to feel hard if you are very new to nose breathing. Again, it's okay. Just do it consciously once today. Just con consciously nose breathe once today. Maybe twice because you're going to do it now and perhaps you're going to do it one other time today. It might feel as if you're not getting enough oxygen. It will be a little bit difficult. And the reason for that is our mouth is bigger. So we're going to take in more air. Conversely, we're letting off more air. And so, yeah, yeah, we are totally wasting all of these gases. Now, oxygen is a pretty cool gas, right? We like it. We love it. We have it. But oxygen is only released in the presence of carbon dioxide. So you can put on an SpO2 monitor and it can read for a healthy, you know, if, especially if you're not in elevation or whatever, like 95 to 99%. But that doesn't mean that that's what your body's actually using. You know, it just means that that's the oxygen within your cells. If you're super sensitive to carbon dioxide, which most mouth breathers are, because again, they're letting off so much more. I mean, if you take a breath in through your nose and let it out through your mouth, you can literally feel the difference because you're going to let off so much more out of your mouth than you took in from your nose, which is why, you know, people will ask, well, how come I can't do that? And that's the reason why, because you're throwing the pH of your body completely off. We need to get more comfortable with carbon dioxide to get more oxygenated, which is a pretty kind of weird concept when you first wrap your head around that. In the presence of ca carbon dioxide, more oxygen is released equals more oxygenation. So it's a pretty cool thing. So we just need to get a little bit more comfortable with it. Does that make sense? 100%. Totally. And I think I just want to throw in like a key note here. Um, for anybody that's listening that like is looking for higher fat burning, fat can only burn in the presence of oxygen. So if you are constantly mouth breathing, you're actually going to burn way less fat fat specifically from your body throughout the course of the day. And also, Kayla, that's a great point because where do we lose weight? 
And well, it depends on the person. No, but through our breath. No, like that's how oh. it's released throughout our body, right? No, well, most people get it through their arms. No, but you know what I'm saying? The only, like, have you ever thought, like, I know you guys have, but until I started, like, really in this nutrition world, it never occurred to me, like, how do we lose weight? Like, we, when I say lose weight, yeah, calories, blah, blah, blah. But what I'm talking about, where does it physically go? Like, I lost 100 pounds, but where does it go? Well, it comes out of our breath. Right, and I think that this is the key here, is that people, like, okay, everything that's on your body, weight specifically, is energy, mm -hmm. right? And if you look at the law of energy, energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be transferred. Right. And so, right, so you're saying here right now, where does that weight go? Well, it needs to be transferred. And how is that transferred? Via your breath. Right. Right. And like you said, in the presence of oxygen, right? And so mm -hmm. the more the more open we are to carbon dioxide, the less sensitive we are to carbon dioxide, the more oxygenated we become. Like if you are an athlete, or even if you're not an athlete, even if you just climb stairs and all of a sudden your legs are like, hmm, wow, that's a deep burn. Well, what happens is, is that our legs are the furthest away from any of our major organs. So we're going to feel it there first. Now you can, you know, insert any type of physical activity where you're like, yeah, I want to do that, but my legs just, you know, they start to burn and it feels really uncomfortable. Again, that goes to oxygen. The oxygen may be there, but as soon as our, our body feels like, oh, we're losing oxygen, we're losing oxygen, it starts kind of starving your legs, more or less. That's pretty much what happens. And so that's when that lactic acid builds up. That's when they feel heavy. That's when it feels pretty cruel and <laughs> uncomfortable. You know, when we're doing any type of physical activity like that, it all comes down to your oxygen. So, yeah. I mean, think about what we've covered so far. We've talked about functional movement. We've talked about our stress response. We've talked about our parasympathetic and our sympathetic state. We're talking about like lactic acid in our legs. I mean, there's so many places that we can bring that. And actually, did Kayla, did you say that something about a panic attack where the breath work has helped you? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, my son was going in for surgery, and I don't know what it is, I've never actually had a traumatic experience in, I'm going to say this lifetime, in a hospital, but he was going in for surgery, the doctor started talking to me, and I was like, I was seeing gray, <laughs> I was like, she, oh my she, god, I'm going to pass out. She had to bring him back to breathing. And I came back to the tactical breathing, so I was doing a four and four ratio breath, and it was the only thing that allowed me to stay conscious yeah. and pay attention to what the doctor was saying. Yeah, and so, and that's such a, that's such a point that I would love to make, because again, I keep talking about this control. In that moment, you have no control. Your son is going in for surgery. It feels pretty out of your control, doesn't it? But what yeah. you can control is how you receive it and how you perceive it. And so you brought it back to your breath and you saved yourself from a complete breakdown. It doesn't mm -hmm. take away that your son's in the hospital, but what it did was give you the control over how you receive or perceive that information. Well, and I think that that's, and that, and that is critical because it looks like every person responds to stress differently. Yeah. I'm a fainter. Like, <laughs> Too stressed out, down. down. <laughs> like, I'm a fainter. <laughs> and so, like, me being able to control my breath to prevent me from fainting is critical. But somebody else who might, like Mike, who responds to stress by, like, you know, like... Going towards. Essentially hitting the roof, um, you know, a allowing him to come back down is, is another thing. We're complete opposites. Yeah, and that's right? such a great point, Kayla, that you just brought up. So, Kayla, you're saying I'm kind of running away. I kind of retreat into myself, but not in a good way, meaning it's overcome mm -hmm. me and I'm almost disassociating, right? 100%. Mike's saying, oh, I see that. I'm going towards it. And what that means for both of you, it doesn't matter, is you're both experiencing this high stress response. Whether you go towards it or away from it, it's still a very high stress response. And what do no. you do after? Because your bodies are going to do that no matter what. That's part of your human experience. But what do you do after it? What do I do now? And so, why don't we try? All right, we're going to try. Right. I'm gonna, we're going to we'll do two quick exercises. Just so that, again, your listeners, yourselves, you guys can, can, can feel it. Because if you can't feel it, you won't actually know what to do with it. You won't know how to – you got to try it on, right? It's like if you just buy your shirt on Amazon, you don't know what it looks like. you got to feel it, man. you got to try it on, see how it feels. Like, yeah, I look good. Okay, cool. Now I'll buy it. So this is what I'm going to ask you guys to do. You guys look pretty comfortable, right? Yeah? All right, cool. Yeah, let's do it. So 
what we'll do is, well, when we talk about the cornerstone of uh, functional breathing or the oxygen advantage, and I should have brought that up. So I'm trained under Patrick McHugh and the oxygen advantage. He is on the forefront of this, you know, as well as like James Nestor, who wrote a book and, uh, Pat, you know, Brian McKenzie and things like that. Yeah. But Patrick McEwen, he is like, he's an animal in this arena. He truly is. And he will not stop. And I love that about him. And he provides us with all the information and everything we could possibly need to help other people. That's all that this is about. Keep delivering this message. Breathe from your nose, breathe from your nose, breathe from your nose. So the cornerstone of, of, the oxygen advantage, as I'm trained, is called LSD. So we're all going to trip out for a minute. No, I'm just kidding. So LSD is, um, L is for light, breathing light. S is for slow, breathing slow. And D is for breathing deep. So are you LSD? Are you breathing light? Are you breathing slow? And are you breathing deep? So slow, we're not in a heightened state. It'll be pretty easy for us to do that right now. Right? You're going to breathe light, slow, and deep. A deep, again, would be if you wanted to connect yourself to your body, you could simply put your hands and feel your diaphragm. So we're going to breathe slow. And what slow also means is sort of like this cadence breathing. Okay? So that's kind of like a tempo. So ideally, if you're a perfect specimen of a human being, you're breathing about like six to 12 breaths per minute. Now, six breaths, if you're a yogi on a mountain who's literally daily focus is just breath, that's what they're doing. That's why they live to 400 years old. Um, but, <laughs> but if you're like us, you can't do that. But if you can spend four minutes a day, even just four minutes a day, it will help wire your brain to understand we don't need this much air. And it's pretty important because if we're over breathers, we are just, again, we're not in good health. We are putting ourselves in a poor health condition. And I know anyone listening to this doesn't want to be. That's why they're listening, right? So this cadence breathing is a four in, six out. So that means you're going to breathe in for four seconds and out for six seconds. Now, if it's too hard, you can always do a three by three. You know, there's different ways to do this. There is no right or wrong. If it's hard, it's again, because you're just not exposed to carbon dioxide. That's all that this is. And this will help to get you there. The reason we want a longer exhale is because now we've left off all of our carbon dioxide, so it will start to build within our body. And that's a good thing. We're not getting as much oxygen and we're letting go of carbon dioxide. Therefore, the carbon dioxide is building in our cells, which means our oxygen is also building in our cells and being released. This one also speaks to your vagus nerve. This will really help calm you down. The cool thing is you can do this anywhere. You can do this in your car. You can do this at your desk. You can do this before bed. It's simply counting and breathing. We can all do that, right? All right. So we're going to try it. Um, we're going to do it for one minute, okay? So it'll be six times, all right? Was I not supposed to be doing it already? I've been doing it this whole time. No, <laughs> you failed. You failed. Just leave, Mike. Oh, Just man. leave, Mike. We're done with you. So he's <laughs> he's an overachiever. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So let's do it, okay? So I'll count for you guys. And if you want to just, you can close your eyes too to anybody listening. Unless you're driving, please don't do that. Um, but sometimes it just helps to connect you to your experience. That's all that it serves to do. So we're going to breathe in from your nose in a count of, excuse me, breathe in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So since you guys are here, tell me your experience. His chest didn't move. Mine did. I did notice that. I'm, I'm, I, I don't think he was breathing, actually. No, I'm, I think he was I'm, just holding his yeah. breath the whole time. The, the thing is, I practice my breathing literally every day a couple times a day. So a 4-6 is, is, a, it is a great starting spot, but I mean... I, I can hold that breath forever. That I don't even feel the air hunger that you're yep. supposed to feel after this when I do that anymore. So 
for me, I'm I'm somewhere in like the ten to fifteen range kind of thing when I do my mm -hmm. breathing, mm -hmm. which is stupid. Yeah, yeah, no, but that's great. So it and again, there is no right or wrong. That four six can seem difficult or easy, right? Well, and did you notice right as soon as we finished, what Kayla did right away was open her mouth to get more oxygen. Yeah. Did you guys notice yeah. that? Because that's the first thing I noticed. Is as soon as we finished, she goes. And that he was staring at me the whole time. It didn't matter. I was going to be judged no matter what I did. I, I judge because I love. I love. I wasn't judging. I was simply being aware. And but you noticed it too. Well, I did. Of course, I did. <laughs> but it's all okay. And so, so Kayla, I mean, you can take this as information. This is feedback for you. This is what I always say. It's just information. It's just feedback. Meaning. Kayla, would it make sense for you to maybe try to do that a couple more times today? If you can do it for three to four minutes, just think. That means that you've only breathed six, or excuse me, you know, in and out six times for four minutes. That's 24 times. If you were to actually count how many times you do it, it would be a lot higher than that. But what you're telling your brain is it's okay. It's rewiring our neural pathways. It's a cool thing. Well, and again, you're also calming yourself down. And so another exercise that I can sort of impart on you, you know, this exercise is great for stress. If you are feeling stressed, we talked an awful lot about stress. Now the four, six is great for stress. There's also this exercise that I'll impart on you guys. Now, this is a great for stress. If you are feeling a panic attack, if you can remember this exercise, it will help you get out of a panic attack. Asthma attack, the same thing. It can help with anxiety. It can help with a racing mind. It can help with, with, again, you've climbed up the stairs. How do you calm yourself back down? And so we'll just do this one a couple times too. So this one is just many small breath holds. This is an introduction to breath holding. Again, it will help pull some of this, you know, oxygen, or excuse me, um, the carbon dioxide within your body to get out more oxygen. Now, Mike just keeps smiling. You're like my brother when I did this with him. My brother's like, well, I don't know. I could just do it forever. It's like, yeah, cool. Okay, shut up. Um, <laughs> we're not all specimens like you guys. <laughs> but for the rest of us mere humans, mere mortals, we're going to do this two second, excuse me, five second. Let me start over. You're going to breathe in and out through your nose, and you're going to hold for five seconds. Then you're going to breathe back in through your nose normal, settle yourself, and in 10 seconds, we'll do it again. So we'll do this one a couple times, okay? And I'll guide you through it. So again, we're going to breathe in through our nose, out through our nose, and hold for five, four, three, two, one. And now just resume normal breath through your nose. Don't open that mouth. And let's try it again. Ready? Breathe in, out, and hold for one, two, three, four, five and resume normal breathing through your nose we'll do it two more times all right one more time normal breath in normal breath out and hold for five four three two one normal breathing and we'll do it one more time normal breath in normal breath out five four three two, one. Kayla, what was your experience there? Um, I just kind of feel tired now. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, after the first, the first exercise you had us do, I was like, wow, is there a nap time schedule today? And then like, <laughs> and then during this one, I'm like, okay, I still feel like I could take a nap. That's interesting. So again, that is probably because you are not as exposed to carbon dioxide. Again, not a good or a bad, it's just information. But also, you really just calmed yourself down. I was going to say that the parasympathetic yeah. state, because she is doing the nasal breathing, and as you do breath holds, it actually drops your heart rate too, which will put you further into that sympathetic yep, state. Which is why... So as the carbon dioxide accumulates, then your body's actually getting more oxygen as that sits, and then and then you actually hit that more relaxed state Yeah, as well. and that's right. And so that's an interesting thing, because that's why this can be a profound exercise before bedtime too, because it will simply put you in that relaxed state. And it yeah, will... Like the 4, 7, 8 breathing is great for right before yeah, bed. Yeah, and it will help bring you down. It will help you not to go to bed stressed. It will help connect your mind to your body, to your soul, to enter sleep. You know, and again, you can use this at any point throughout the day. You are all going to perceive stress in a certain way, right? But what do we do with that? And this is what you do with it. Just a couple little techniques, just a couple shifts in your breathing. Again, just for today. 
And then what's going to happen? We have this pretty cool thing in our brain. It's called the reticular activating system, our RSA. And what that cool thing does is that, like, if you go to buy a car, you know, you're going to go buy a, a, you know, a Ford Mustang, a, a, a bright blue Ford Mustang. And you're going down the highway and you're like, there's one. There's another one. There's another one. Everyone has blue Mustangs. Well, you haven't paid attention to the 700 other cars that you've seen. You've only paid attention to that one. And we can use this to our advantage for something like this. You're going to listen to this podcast. You probably shut your mouth and did a couple nose breeze. I applaud you. Your body applauds you. So does your mind and your spirit, right? But you might do it one other time today. And all that serves to do is to help you for tomorrow. Because now you might have to do it only one more time. And now you've thought about it three times. You've become consciously aware of your breath three times, perhaps the next day. And it will only start to build off of that. It is hard if you're a mouth breather. And I'm not labeling you. That's not, you know, forgive me. But if you are breathing from your mouth and that's what feels comfortable, the minute you switch to this nose breathing, it can feel very hard. But when you can control it, meaning don't do it while you're exercising right away. Do it while you're sitting in bed. Because nothing has happened. There's no perceived danger. You're safe. It's a little bit of a stressor. Just hang in there. Go past that point, just a tiny little bit. Dip your feet in that water. I think the beautiful thing with breathing is that because it's so it's such a natural movement to begin with, you can bring it into any aspect of your life. Like we, we run a fitness business. So if we are getting our clients when they're first starting to start walking or for anybody who's listening right now, if you're just starting a fitness journey and what you do right now is walking, bring breathing, mindful breathing into your walking, right? So then you're, you're paying attention to those inhales and exhales and you're just being more mindful of it day to day as you go if you if you love cooking or baking like Kayla does when you're sitting there cooking or baking you're basically in like a an autonomic state at that mm-hmm. point because you've done it so many times that it's just it's mindless work for you so throw that mindful breathing into it right it can, it can be brought into any aspect of our lives which is the beautiful thing Even, about it and I grew up a mouth breather yeah. so I I uh, can totally relate to that and I know I need to practice this more and she's, I'm she's working, heard a lot. I think I'm working on it. I just I feel like I'm already always berated by it sometimes. You know, <laughs> you know I'm I'm like that defiant child. Yeah. I'm like, no, mom, because you said I have to do this. I'm not it's, doing it. Well, the I, rebellious for, side. For me, I never really learned about the breath until I until I did get older. But the crazy thing is, is when I was even younger, when I used to run, like I did long distance running, and when I would run, I was always breathing through my nose, and I never got tired. And people. Like other people that I'm racing against, I see them and they're chest breathing and they're breathing through their mouths and they're dying. And, I, and I'm just going forever. And I'm like, this is easy. What are we yeah, doing? Yeah. And it's such an interesting thing, you know. So I took, you know, I started this a couple of years ago and I work out often and I'm like, okay, well, no, I, no, I just got to go work out. And what I had to do was really stop the intensity of my workouts for like a month. And I know that seems yeah. like a lot. And if you're not training for something, it's okay. I ha- because listen, you're also still working out because your diaphragm is now used, being used in a different way. And so you're still getting that same experience, right? But I literally had to sort of put my ego, hey, check that at the door, right? Like I'm just going to consciously be aware of my breath. I actually would tape my mouth just to make sure that I was doing it, you know, just to make sure I'm going to nose breathe. Now, if you catch me nose bre- mouth breathing, I would be shocked. I hike. I hike a great deal. And... I'm always the one nose breathing. You can, I, you know, we hike the Appalachian Trail. No one I've ever seen is nose breathing, but I am. And at first it was so hard. I couldn't hike as fast or as far because I just wasn't used to that resistance. And so it is hard and it can be hard, but you're doing a world of good. Again, it's that controlled stress. It's that resiliency. Push past that. Go past that just a tiny little bit. You will be better for it. it. It will become easier for you. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, we all come into this life expecting, like, we, we should know how to move our bodies. Like, I should know how to activate my muscles. I should know how to breathe. And I feel like that this is, like, a critical turning point for us. Is like, no, you don't know how to move your muscles, and you don't know how to breathe. And let's just start back call, to basics. Call and a spade practice. a spade. Yeah. Everything... 
everything worth having in life is worth working for. So you, you're going to be a constant work on yourself anyways. You may as well work on the things that are most important. That's right. That's right. And we uh, talked about this yesterday, right? We are the sum of our choices. And to that, I say, what choice are you making today? Mm-hmm. What choice are 100%. you making today? Are you making a choice to, you know, breathe out of your nose once or twice? And we don't have to make 75 choices to change our life. We just need to make one. Just one choice today, just to switch that nose breathing. That's it. For sure. Breathe better, feel better, move better, digest better. Like, I mean, just, it just, it, it's a cascade Love effect. better. Love better. You will love better because you will be more open to yourself. If you are not connected with yourself, you cannot love each other, anybody else because you don't love yourself. You're not stepping inward. When we step inward towards ourself and our breath serves to do that. Again, how many different ways did we just talk about the breath and how impactful it can be? You know, like 17 of them. Maybe the first 16 weren't for you, but maybe that loved one is. I don't know. Try it on. See how it feels. Be your choice today. Mindful awareness. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on today's episode, Tiffany. It's truly been a pleasure having you, and we would obviously love to have you back again. Um, this is this is wonderful, wonderful information to share with the world. Yeah. Next time we're gonna dive a little deeper. Yeah, <laughs> truly, truly. If it's possible. Yeah. No, of course. There's a there's always deeper. Oh, I know. Well, yeah. Next time we'll talk about COPD. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, you know, we can help those too. So um, absolutely. Yeah, in the world exactly. of breath, there's so much more to talk to. And I have thoroughly enjoyed, you know, connecting with you guys. I think that you guys are something special, truly. And I know that your clients know that you guys are. But for those that aren't your clients, woo, you got to get to them. I'm telling you. I see it. I feel it from you guys. You guys exude it. And I'm so honored to be on here today. And, I, yeah, if you'll have me back, maybe I'll join. 100%. So, so just, we're going to put in sure. the show notes anyways, but for anybody that's looking to find information about how to contact you and how to learn more about the Breathing Advantage, where do we Yeah, go? that's great. So if anybody does want to get a little deeper, you know, I'm sort of at this sort of pivotal moment where I'm just sort of letting the universe decide. And at first I was like, well, if I'm going to have this business, I need to have the logo on and the color and the blah, blah. I'm really not there. I'm letting the universe decide. So right now, just my social accounts is where I can be or my email. And we can see if, if, you know, coming either into my workshop or being a one-on-one client makes sense. Just dig a little deeper and see if it's for you. So you can find me on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and email is Tiffany at pursuing So, and like Perfect. I said, you guys can link those. And if it's something you want to go a little deeper on, let's see if it's a good fit. That would be wonderful. Thank you again so much for taking the time today. That was great. Yeah. Avenue. We'll talk my soon. pleasure. Thanks a lot. We hope you loved today's episode and found some awesome information in it that you can use in your life. If you want more information on contacting Tiffany, you can find her at Tiffany at PursuingAlchemy.com. Her Facebook and Instagram handles will be located in the show notes today. If you liked this episode, please share it with a friend, a family member, or a loved one. And stay tuned for next time for more amazing episodes. Bye for now.